All right, everyone, um, thanks for coming along. We're just waiting for a few more people to sort of um, uh, sign in. Okay, what time is it? So, um, all right, well, thank you for coming, everyone. We're just um, waiting just for a few more people to sign in and then we'll get started. Um, um, so, yeah, before we, while we're waiting for other people, I might make just a few quick uh, announcements. Oh, first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christopher Hunt. I, I'm a clinical psychologist at the University of Sydney Gambling Treatment Clinic, and I um, am mostly in charge of organizing um, these journal clubs, which uh, for the moment are webinar formats. Um, the next one is going to be um, in mid to late October. We have um, got the topic ready, and we're going to be announcing it very soon once we get the speakers lined up, but it's going to be something that I'm sure a lot of you are going to be interested in. It's going to be particularly relevant to the new environment we're all working in. Um, I'd also like to make another announcement on behalf of one of my colleagues. So um, my colleague, Kerry um, McAllister, she's um, made a note that uh, her and um, one of our colleagues, Annette Toomey from Mission Australia, um, are trying to set up a network um, of counsellors who uh, are working with uh, Aboriginal clients. And so if you are interested in joining that network, um, to please contact either her or Annette Toomey uh, via email. Um, if you don't, for those of you that are interested but don't have their contact details, um, just send me an email and I'll be able to put you in touch with them. All right, um, so getting started, I'll quickly introduce um, our esteemed speakers for today. So um, today we're having a panel discussion basically to give um, people a chance to uh, ask questions that they may have always had about how poker machines operate, how wagering operates how different forms of gambling operates in ways that might be clinically relevant um, to their work with clients. Um, so one of our, our first speaker is uh, Emeritus Professor Alex Blazinski, who um, works here at the University of Sydney and holds a position of the Director of the Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic. Um, so he is a researcher and clinical psychologist with a long history of involvement in the treatment and clinical study on gambling disorders. Um, and he's also the Editor-in-Chief of International Gambling Studies and the current President of the National Association for Gambling Studies. Um, and in the other corner, we have uh, Dr. Clive Orcock, who is a psychiatrist who has been working with problem gamblers for over 35 years. Um, he's also a keen horse race punter, and I'm sure he can tell us more than pretty much even any of our clients can on horse racing. Um, he is also a life member of the National Association for Gambling Studies and currently serves as a trustee to the New South Wales Responsible Gambling Fund. All right, so we're going to get started with uh, Alex speaking and he's going to be giving uh, a presentation on, um, I guess, an overview of the history of what we now know in Australia as the poker machine. So um, over to you, Alex. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, just a note of correction, I'm not the president, I'm the ex-president of the National Association, I'm the current secretary. Um, what I propose to do uh, today, effectively, is to have a, a, a fun meeting in terms of uh, looking at uh, the history, the background of uh, electronic gaming machines, and I'm going to spend uh, only 15 minutes to go through it all, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Uh, so pay attention um, if I can get this thing to work. 
Um, first of all, the disclosures, I get, obtained money from the industry and from government. Uh, now, the, the key issues effectively with the uh, pictorial history of slot machines is to uh, look at the uh, overview of what types of machines have developed, the impact of laws on the configuration of slot machines, because it's quite interesting. And then the differences in uh, Europe and the USA in terms of the spread of uh, slot machines. I think one of the important elements is that the uh, psychological principles and, and uh, the slot machines that have been uh, raised today have in fact been raised many years ago in the early days. And I think this particular quote of uh, history is a giant old jukebox that many records it contains play the same music over and over, time after time, year after year, no matter where you are. And I think this applies often to uh, electronic gaming machines. Um, so, why we focus on it is quite uh, self-evident. Uh, the majority of slot machines uh, provide the revenue to the uh, government and to the industry, and uh, they contribute to uh, gambling disorders. They're overrepresented amongst gamblers in treatment, and uh, we all know effectively that they provide significant uh, problems, partly due to their structural characteristics. And this, of course, is the uh, continuous uh, rapid play, uh, the concept of uh, near wins. We've got um, the uh, multiple bets, uh, losses disguised as wins, random reinforcement, and the grand prize. The larger the prize, obviously, the more attractive it is to play. And then we have the free spin features. So all of these are identified as factors that contribute to uh, continuous and excessive uh, play and the development of an individual with a gambling disorder. Just in terms of terminology, because I want to put it into historical context, that uh, we talk about coin-operated, coin-freed, vending machines, slot machines, and these are all machines that operate uh, or release items through the insertions of a coin or a token. Um, and we've seen this uh, effectively in across a range of uh, machines, vending machines, and indeed uh, um, on the right hand side toilets. It's interesting that the uh, first coin operated machine occurred effectively uh, around 1000 BC to dispense uh, the amount of holy, uh, holy water. And the initiative or the motivation for this was to prevent uh, people wanting to take uh, holy water, taking more than they actually paid for, which I thought was somewhat interesting. But the coin freed machines effectively remained dormant until the industrial Re revolution. And this is uh, quite interesting because then we obviously know that uh, there's been a rapid increase in, in mechanization and in the industrial uh, development. And here we find that the coin freed or the vending machines started to become very popular. The first commercial machine uh, dispensed uh, postcards and uh, stamps and became uh, quite uh, popular. What we then have is the development of uh, amusement uh, uh, parlors. Uh, Commencing in about 1890s, these were referred to as automatic shops or penny arcades. Um, and Roy Orbison's uh, song, Penny Arcade, sort of uh, highlights the attraction of these particular issues. In the 1900s, there were 170 of these arcades in London, providing a broad range of different types of machines. And these were weight machines, shooting games, uh, music machines, stereo flip cards, kinescope uh, sort of films and strength testing. And then they had fortune telling as well. And the idea effectively with the fortune telling one was that the person would spin uh, the wheels and then uh, the particular fortune would, uh, would be displayed. These were extremely popular, but the concept of chance and prediction ins provided inspiration for later gambling games. So what we found effectively then in 1876 was a guessing bank machine developed by Edward McLaughlin in New York. 
This was a uh, machine uh, that sat on the uh, counter within the uh, bars and people would pick a number where the pointer would stop and uh, there'd be a, a small prize uh, relative to the uh, insertion of a penny. So the idea effectively was similar to a roulette or a chocolate wheel. Um, and these proved to be uh, really quite, uh, quite popular and the forerunner of the uh, development of subsequent machines. These machines uh, were very popular essentially because they were uh, locked cabinets, uh, metal cabinets. There was no direct loss uh, from theft from the machines for the operator. It required only the insertion of uh, money by others so that uh, the um, shopkeeper didn't have any uh, involvement in the cash transaction. There was low investment, high earning potentials from repeated play. And what we found effectively was that there were some differences in the laws, and this is where it became quite uh, important, that in France in 1781, gambling for money was prohibited by Louis XVI. So these machines proved not to be so popular within uh, France. Um, in Britain, the Betting and Gaming Act uh, restricted gambling, but uh, uh, still permitted some of these particular uh, arcade games to uh, to continue. And I'll talk about uh, the law uh, shortly. In the States, it was quite different because in France and Britain, the law applied to the whole country, whereas in USA, the laws were state-based. And in some cases, if one uh, particular state prohibited these machines, um, they would simply move to the adjoining uh, state. So it became more difficult to have a consistent law prohibiting them. So in Britain and Europe, the degree of skill defined the games, and so that they had low, low payout skill games, uh, like the pachinko drop cases where you drop a ball and it uh, goes down into a particular um, slot and the slot would determine the, uh, the prize. Uh, in France, the spinning dial games, the roulette type games were permitted if trade tokens paid no more than three times the original state, so they have limited on their prizes. And uh, these were popular from 1900 to the 1930s and followed effectively the influence of the USA. Um, the USA itself had dial and it dropped popular, followed by the real games in uh, the 1890s. And this is where the sort of uh, electronic gaming machines as we know it now occurred. The first ones being Sitman and Pitt. 1887, followed by uh, Liberty Bell and Charles uh, Fay, um, and then developing in various formats until uh, the first video slots emerged in uh, the 1970s, the late or mid, mid to late 1970s, and then the electronic games uh, developed with more sophistication uh, from the 70s to the current uh, time frame. So what we have uh, currently are slot machines, poker machines, video lottery terminals, fruit machines, Tactilo, which is a lottery type game played in uh, Switzerland, um, video draw poker, video blackjack, electronic roulette, referred to effectively as electronic gaming machines or electronic gaming devices. Um, so these were all following the uh, early uh, variations. And they involved from the three, simple three reel to the sophisticated electronic gaming machines we see today. Um, no substantive difference to uh, the general principles and the psychological principles involved, but certainly different in terms of its uh, mechanical versus electronic operations and the colors, sounds and uh, excitement generated. So what we have currently is the notion of uh, the game designers maximizing revenue per, for available customers and time on device. And the idea effectively is that uh, the operators design these particular machines to be addictive. The reality is that the slots predated designers and addiction experts. In fact, we know that Willem Wundt uh, started the first experimental psychology back in 1879. Um, so effectively, 
the Stittman and uh, Charles Fay developed these particular machines intuitively with no input in terms of the psychological uh, principles involved. Um, I think they worked out by trial and error that these were in fact very popular machines, um, played to excess by some, and very lucrative to uh, the operators. So you can see that the Clubmaster, the first lock machine in Australia, was almost identical to the uh, Liberty Bell. Um, you'll see that the uh, Liberty Bell has three reels with the icon showing per reel. Um, and then subsequent ones had uh, sort of more reels uh, showing. So just uh, go back. Um, so in the uh, Clubmaster one, we had uh, the reels above and below showing so that uh, it provided some degree of near miss. The mechanical version of current gaming machines uh, were prevalent in those particular times as well. We had the uh, roulette, uh, mechanical roulette. Um, we've had virtual uh, horse racing, virtual cycling, um, mechanical horse racing. So all these were really quite popular. Um, currently we have in some uh, TABs virtual racing, uh, which is based on the same sort of uh, principle. So there's a broad range of these particular uh, gaming machines. Interesting with the laws, the laws prohibited uh, gambling. So we had uh, trade machines and roulette and poker games, but uh, to avoid the laws that would have uh, signs indicating no gambling allowed on this machine and the trade machines provided uh, outcomes in terms of cigars. So you'd play the machine and you would, if you won, you'd get uh, two or three uh, free cigars you would get two or three uh, uh, gumballs, um, effectively to bypass the laws on gambling. What was quite interesting was that many people would play these particular machines and would fail to uh, pick up the cigars or the mints or the gumballs or give them to somebody else. So it was quite clear that the uh, people at that particular stage weren't gambling on these trade machines for the actual product but simply uh, enjoying the, uh, the game. We had the old uh, midget uh, lucky spots um, and we had the skill draw poker as well in those particular days. So we have uh, uh, blackjack poker, early games mimicking what we have currently. From the start, the gaming machines were identified with harm despite the fact that uh, the prizes were relatively limited or that uh, they didn't actually pick up the trade uh, cigars or gumballs. So we see effectively the operator uh, receiving huge amounts of money, um, profiteering from uh, the gaming machines and exploitation of the vulnerable, the addiction there, the heart flush versus the broken heart. And again, uh, uh, smashing these machines for the uh, uh, protection of uh, morality. And then all the way through, we have currently the uh, prohibition era, addiction by designs, um, the criticism effectively or failure of the government and others to uh, limit the availability of these particular gamings. But we have effectively from the 1900s all the way through to our current days, uh, attempts to uh, effectively prohibit gambling um, removing these, um, destroying the machines in various formats um, or trying to uh, restrict them. But and even today we have these particular uh, attempts to do it. But having said that, what we're now finding effectively is that the electronic gaming machines continue to form the central place in uh, gambling and expanding now effectively to uh, slot machines, um, such as Lightning, which are very popular, very colorful. And then we go onto the online versions of these particular uh, slot machines, playing free slot machines or playing for money on regulated or unregulated uh, sites overseas. And then we have the targeting of children with the uh, um, games, which are not gambling games, but free games. Um, designed to play for children. So I'll leave it at that. Um, 
at 15 minutes and throw it back to uh, Chris. You're on mute, Chris. Thank you, Alex. And I might actually take this opportunity to ask a question that basically um, a lot of my clients ask me and perhaps you're aware, you know, I think your sort of speech alludes to the answer, but um, it's a myth that sort of is out there quite widely in the community. Is it true that um, that aristocrat and other poker machine manufacturers employ teams and teams of psychologists to deliberately um, make people addicted to their machines? Uh, there is no evidence to that effect. Um, I had a tour of Len Ainsworth um, with, uh, through his factory and we came across one section there, a booth of uh, four people playing the machines and I asked what these people were doing and uh, Len effectively said that these were the testers, they would uh, play the machines to see whether they enjoyed them. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't have any highly sophisticated addiction experts uh, deliberately trying to work out how to uh, uh, entice addiction to, uh, to these particular people. I, I could add to that, uh, as I was part of that tour, that uh, we saw the artwork department <clears throat> and uh, they were putting a lot of work trying to make things attractive. And they commented that, uh, of course, there was a, not long after the days of Queen of the Nile, but that for some reason, these Egyptian symbols seemed to appeal to people. But that was about as sophisticated as it got. Um, and Len himself, when we were looking at, didn't like one label and didn't like one design. And obviously, everybody was thinking about changing it. So I, I'd back that up. There's, there's been no evidence at all that they are hiring people to specifically uh, deal with this issue. And if, if you wanted a bigger example of that, you can go to the Gambling Expo conference. You couldn't this year because it was closed and online, but you see massive of numbers of machines, millions of dollars worth of machines, and then club owners and pub owners wander around trying to buy them with various deals to send them back if they don't work. And they're all competing because nobody knows exactly what works. They often don't know until it gets out into the venue to play, and sometimes it's a total failure. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, I, thanks. I, I just, that was a myth. I think that's quite persistent that mm. I thought was important to sort of highlight before now I'm going to throw over to Clive, who's going to give um, his thoughts on, um, on his, you know, 35, is it up to 40 now or is it? Uh, it it's going to get worse, which I will do. <laughs> Um, look, thanks. Chris. I, I just thought if you folks will bear with me, I'm going to be a little indulgent because it sets the scene and for some of the observations I'm going to make. And I'm going to keep it very short because we're mindful we have questions and we would love to have more questions because we want to really explore as many options as we can in this particular occasion. But uh, my nefarious background was that I grew up in a place uh, in Gisborne um, in, in New Zealand. My apologies for that. Please don't hold that against me. But at a very early age, I learned to ride horses. And I showed a little ability and I went on to become a senior riding instructor and uh, for a person who went on to become a psychiatrist, my forte was helping to retrain horses that we bought cheaply that had problems and then uh, under the skill and guidance of a very experienced horsewoman who ran the place, we would sell them for a profit. And so that was the background that got me aware of horses and then from that I became aware of, uh, of gambling. And my first bet was uh, illegal at the age of 15, where uh, as a tip from the local doctor, I put uh, 10 shillings, which gives away a little bit more as well, onto a horse that went 100 yards and bucked the jockey off. And I've been trying to get that money back ever since. It's a tragic example of uh, chasing losses, uh, a nigh on 60 year history. Um, some years I've had winning years and um, others uh, losing years because I have been quite involved in trying to research gambling techniques uh, my father was a mathematician and I had some uh, go at that as well. So it, when I was involved in all of this, I started learning about gambling in New Zealand. The only thing available was horse racing. There were little things called art unions, which were $1,000, $2,000 prizes. Then in 1961, they introduced a big lottery called the Golden Kiwi, not surprisingly. And ironically, the first winner was a racehorse trainer who my family knew. And her immediate reaction on winning the prize, which I think was something like $30,000 compared to the smaller ones, was it was great to win it, but she'd rather have won the Auckland Cup, which shows you the position that racing was in. I came over here in 74, and I found that we have, of course, horse racing. We had the Opera House, 
and we had these poker machines which at that time were only in clubs and so already we're beginning to see in my lifetime a plethora an increase if you like in gambling and gambling issues then we rolled on and Alex and I started getting interested in problem gambling in the late 70s um, and we, we saw mostly people with horse racing problems and I often try to stress that to meetings such as this because everybody thinks gee whiz you know, it's poker machines there's something sinister and specific about poker machines but before they were only in the clubs then it was horse racing there's about two-thirds of the people coming to see us for problems were, were uh, mostly the racing rather than the trotting or the greyhounds but on the way through, um, I, of course, as we all have, have seen um, the poker machines go into the pumps in the middle of the 1990s. And that was when the swing occurred quite dramatically from horse racing to poker machines being the most prominent one. We've seen casinos be established. And looking to the future, we've seen online gambling. Um, but, but now online gambling is spreading into things like esports. Uh, of course, daily fantasy sports, um, uh, skins, loot boxes, which people question whether or not they are gambling, but they meet the definition of gambling. Yeah. And so we've seen this amazing growth and will continue to see, I believe, growth in forms of gambling. But what has intrigued me is as we've done community surveys, and the first ones were Alex and I with Mark Dickerson were involved in the 1990s, the percentage of people who have a serious problem has remained remarkably the same. Uh, there may have been occasional blip ups, but this has been so right around the world, whatever you know, country you're in, whatever it was 30 years ago when you were testing it, it has remained the same. And this has intrigued me. I, I've often wondered, you know, have we gone about as far as we can go? Now, obviously, we're working very hard at trying to promote awareness of gambling problems in the community and look at ways and techniques such as the therapeutic techniques to try and reduce the prevalence of problem gambling, but it remains stubbornly solid. Uh, what we are seeing, which is interesting, is a decline in the prevalence studies of the number of people who gamble and the so-called low risk, and I'll come to why I've used the word so-called in a few moments and then finish up and open up for questions. So perhaps in 20 years time, we may see a reduction in the percentage of serious problems. Uh, but um, at the moment, it's remaining consistent. We, we see a increase in the number of people who don't gamble, an increase in the number in the low risk category, um, some slight increase sometimes in the moderate risk, pretty stable in the, um, in the serious problem gambling group. Uh, why is it so? Well, I think, there's always going to be a core who will try these things. And then you get to the question of the definition. Um, the, the issue about what is low and what is moderate is very vexed. Um, when Alex and I were asked along with Mark Dickerson in the 1990s by the Casino Community Benefit Fund to do the first prevalence study, we were, what do we do? All we could use was the SOGS, the South Oaks Gambling Screen. We couldn't use the 20 questions for GA because there wasn't a lot of um, validity for it. The South Oaks Gambling Screen had been around, had been created by Henry Lazur and Shirley Bloom. Shirley Bloom. Um, it was intended to be, um, you walk through the door to meet your counsellor, your counsellor uh, gives you the South Oaks Gambling Screen perhaps to give you a guide as to where the person was. Now, Alex and I have met, uh, and you may have well met Sheila as well, Alex, but um, we met Henry, and Henry was never a gambler. He, he told me very proudly he'd never put a dime in a poker machine. So when they first developed the scale based on questionnaires on Gamblers Anonymous people, they set a limit of three. You scored three, you had a problem gambling. You scored one or two, you didn't. No, it was either or, clear cut. Then they realized that even that was going to be creating a, a really larger number of people that were realistically likely to have a serious problem. So they raised the level to five. But again, it was either or. Score four, you're okay. Score five, you've got a problem. Now, when we were starting to do this first community survey, we had concerns that in Australia with five, you'd have, again, an unrealistic finding. Both Alex and I had noted that the majority of the people, at least 90%, who came through the door um, was scoring more than 10 on the SOGs. And so it was discussion uh, as a team, and we had others other than those that I've named on, on that team. We raised the cutoff point to 10, but in order to appease, um, I guess, international concerns and others, we said if you score between five and nine, you are at risk. Now, that was the first time in the literature that the at risk concept uh, was introduced. And then when it was decided the SOGS wasn't good enough for the community surveys, and, and then the um, 
Canadian index was developed, combining some of the SOGs and some of the DSM, uh, you then got this category of moderate and low. Um, and there are strong criticisms of that and how valid it is. Probably one of the best surveys looking at that was done by academia and also government in Canada by Curry et al, uh, who said really there's absolutely no validity whatsoever for the uh, low and moderate risk. Uh, but the serious are, are clinically distinct difference as are the non-gamblers. And they strongly advised against incorporating serious and moderate to try and build up your sample size and reach conclusions about problem gambling. What I've seen also in my time is that unfortunately, these seem to have been locked into people's thinking. That, that they, as they are more valid than, people, than they really are in, in people's views and people's estimations. And some of the guesstimates and estimates about harm that relate to these other groups, I, I think are possibly quite questionable. I mean, if you're learning about gambling and, uh, and you're a young person starting up, 18, 20, 21, you probably will have in the same way with drinking, you know, a few days where you gamble more and lose more than you really wanted to. But that's part of the learning curve. And yet that could be incorporated into studies of low risk particularly, um, and perhaps lead to overreactions um, you know, from authorities um, trying to sort of work to ways to minimizing harm. So I think they're useful guides, but we need to be very careful about hanging our hats on them. Now on the way through, and then I will wind up and we can open for questions, um, just uh, my little background again. I was a director of a company that raced and bred horses for seven years in the 80s. We were on the stock exchange at one um, time and became private. And I was for three years um, in the 1990s, the punters representative to an advisory committee uh, to the Australian Jockey Club, which ran racing in New South Wales at that time, which led me to have a lot of contact with bookmakers, uh, organizations, trainers and jockeys. Um, I remain a small punter, um, very small these days compared to the 90s. I'm interested still in studying ways of trying to uh, finish in front, but it's extremely difficult. And I have some winning years, as I said, and some losing years. It's fun and it's entertainment. Now with that background and those thoughts, um, I think Chris, we're ready to tackle the questions. Yeah, so um, if you do have questions, send them through in using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We do have some questions that people had sent through earlier. And I might just start with a question that was just sent to me um, by the chat by uh, Antonella from Coazet, which I guess is sort of, it feels like the answer's already implied in some of the stuff that you were speaking about just there, Clive, is um, she's asking, do, do you believe that the number of gamblers would be the same today if we had some of those previous slot machines that Alex was describing before? Oh, well, Alex, you have first throw at that one. Oh, look, I think, I think it's a complex answer. If we look back at the uh, first prevalence study back in the uh, mid-1970s with Kelly Kaufman, the prevalence rates of problem gambling there were estimated to be about 0.79, uh, um, roughly about 0.7%. Uh, this was at a time when uh, the only legal uh, state with gambling was in uh, Nevada. Uh, so there's quite clearly uh, gambling going in uh, other uh, jurisdictions. Then we had the changes in uh, laws and the increase in availability of gambling. We found that there was an increase of uh, uh, problem gambling. There is a sort of uh, almost like a honeymoon period where increased availability, more people started playing, more people started to get uh, problems, and then there was a tapering off. So uh, when we look at the figures, uh, sort of the post 90s, we find a tapering off back to a stable level of roughly uh, uh, 0.5 to 1.5, depending on your jurisdictions, but ranging around about uh, 1%. And that seems to be relatively uh, stable over a period of time. Um, so I think that there's something uh, intrinsic effectively about the prevalence rate, which is like many other sort of uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, ranging around that 1% uh, figure. And I think that irrespective of the availability, I think, as we see, increased uh, gambling through online opportunities, uh, mobile phones, uh, offshore betting. Uh, again, we still see the uh, rates being roughly 1%, uh, although the overall participation rate seems to be dropping down a bit. 
yeah, I think uh, I couldn't really add anything to that other than saying that I was very impressed by some of those cartoons that you dug up there, Alex. And it clearly shows that um, it, it, right, right from the time these sorts of machines were introduced, there was a clear recognition that there was a core group who would have a problem with them. And, and that's, that's tragic and it affects their families. Um, but I, I guess my simple answer to Alice's question would be, I, I think the percentages would have been pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right, well, thank you for that one. Now I have a question from, uh, from Nick from St. Vincent's Hospital that he emailed through uh, earlier in the week. And so what he asked is, um, is there an estimated average rate of return for sports betting and horse racing over time? Um, and assuming there is, is this information publicly available as it is with poker machines? I might have first crack at that one. And so the answer is uh, both yes and no. If you're talking about the uh, the TAB uh, particularly, there are clear percentage rates. Uh, for win betting, the takeout rate is 14.5%, um, with what's called rounding down, that effectively becomes 15.5%. Now, for those of you not familiar what I mean by that term, if the computers uh, work out that the horse that uh, Alex and I has backed uh, should be returning $3.26 for the win, that will be rounded down to $3.20. Um, and so that adds effectively at least another 1% to win bets and another 2% to place bets. And in my days as a punter's rep, um, we realized that um, then figures were freely available. They're not freely available now because then the TAB was government owned. Something like 30 million was made in the 1990s uh, per year from this rounding down which has caused quite a bit of angst uh, amongst punters generally when they're aware of it because they think it should go back to them. With sports betting, um, sports betting is probably the fairest. It's two teams. It's usually a 5% takeout um, and, and therefore the odds are pretty, pretty fair. Um, and then with the bookmakers though, that's where my no comes in because bookmakers don't publish their figures. If you've looked at the uh, percentages on at the uh, TAB or on, even on the TV, you'll see figures like 120%, 117% when the horses nearly jump. And that's working out the odds and showing what the percentage against the punter actually is. But because bookmakers take varying bets, it's unclear exactly what they get. And conversations with bookmakers over the year have suggested the takeout rate, if you like, or their profit is roughly 8%. Um, should this information be readily available? I think the answer to that is yes. It certainly should be presented to clients as part of the cognitive component of, of your therapy and your treatment. Whether it makes much difference, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I've always argued that I felt the behavioral component of CBT is perhaps a little stronger than the cognitive component uh, because we all see people who say, you know, I know those figures, um, but I still go and gamble. Um, but uh, I certainly think it's important that they're known um, and they can be a little bit hard to get hold of those figures I've talked about from the TAB. Okay. Um, did you have add on that one, Alex? Or? No, I think probably the, from a therapeutic point of view or clinical point of view, um, probably the best uh, uh, figures would relate to uh, uh, how many people who have a TAB account or a sports betting account over 12 months, what percentage of those people are in fact ahead. And the figures there are relatively uh, quite small within the sort of uh, round about the one, one figure okay. mark. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so I have another question that was given to us by email beforehand. So this is from uh, from my new intern, Adrian, and he wants to ask about uh, skill-based gaming machines. Um, so he was asking, you know, does it look like they'll be legislated and how are they different from current gaming machines and what the effect of them is likely to be? Alex, why don't you pass some comments on that one? The skill-based games uh, are one in which there is a, a skill component uh, um, in it, but the uh, more skilled you become, the more it compensates. So effectively, the return, the overall return to player percentage remains uh, within the uh, legally defined uh, 85 to roughly 91% uh, area, on average 91%. Um, so there is some skill element involved. Um, but uh, at the moment, they're being trialled, they're being uh, used in Atlantic City. Um, but I don't think they've gained really widespread acceptance uh, at this particular stage. But certainly, they're being reviewed. We've undertaken some studies. Um, 
that uh, indicate that some people do enjoy them, uh, others find them quite confusing and they don't fully understand the skill-based uh, component to it. Um, I, I've still trying to get my head around the concept of uh, a skill-based game which would imply that the more proficient you become, the longer you play or the more money you return, um, but the return to player percentage remains the same. So I think what happens is that there is a compensation that the better you become, the harder it is to actually win. Whether or not they'll be accepted uh, legal-wise, um, the real concern at this particular stage is the uh, illusion of control, the, the concept that people have some degree of skill that they may in fact influence the outcome. That's where the, uh, the perceived danger is of these particular machines. Yeah, I think uh, Alex has raised the, the relevant points there. Uh, uh, most particularly that the return to the player ultimately is the same. You might last a little longer um, because there may be some margin to sort of move the percentages around a wee bit. But essentially, uh, the machines are still there to make money for the operator and the governor. But whereas something like horse racing, for example, there are professional gamblers. And these are people who work really hard to try and overcome, particularly that 8%. Uh, most of them are delighted to make maybe 2% a year on turnover. They may have a very high turnover, millions of dollars. So there is room for skill, as there is in poker. There's room for skill. There's, there's no room for skill with these machines. And as Alex correctly says, uh, it, pretending that there is really, I think, is illusionary. But it will suck some people in, at least for a while. <laughs> All right. Well, um, here's a, another question about poker machines that we got from uh, from email beforehand. So, and just to everyone in um, in the session, please feel free to keep sending me via the chat any questions that you do have. Um, but this one comes from Ron Strauss, and he wants to know. Um, he asks, um, "We know that poker machines have random number generators, um, but are they all operational? And do they lend themselves to being switched off remotely to allow um, the program to have free reign?" I, I'll pick up on that one, Ron, because um, I, I'm going to shock you. Uh, these machines are not random. They're what's called pseudo-random. Um, and uh, lest people get totally confused by that, let me try and explain what I mean. Let's say Alex and I decide in the foyer of the Brain, brain Mind Centre that we're going to toss a coin uh, for hours at a time, five days in a row. Now, as long as Alex hasn't bought along his double-headed coin, at the end of the week, um, we'll be roughly even. You know, one of us might have a little bit more than the other because the outcome is truly random. However, let's say Sydney University finds out what we're doing and they say, well, we'd like a piece of the action. We'd like, say, 10% of what you're turning over. Then the question is, how do they work out what 10% of our turnover is? We'd have to keep records and everything else. But that's what's happened with poker machines. They are taking out 10% for the government and the industry. So straight away, it ceases to be a purely random game. It has to have an algorithm in it that ensures that that 10% comes out and then the rest gets returned in a random fashion, but essentially it means that they're, they're pseudo-random. I've asked industry quite a few times over how many games do they run this logarithm. Nobody really seems to have an answer, but the best guess seems to be about every 100,000 games. And lest you think that straight away, if you can learn the logarithm, you can go and make a fortune on the machines. It's designed to turn over about 14 to 16 choices every second. So when you push the button, you've no idea whether you're going to get the third or the 11th of that particular group. So from the point of view of the um, player, they're still random, but boringly, pedantically, technically, I guess, they are pseudo-random. Um, they leave the operating, um, the, the machine builder at a set uh, amount. 10% uh, is pretty much the standard these days. That cannot be altered by the club or anybody else. There's no way of turning them off, manipulating them. They're set that way. Uh, the whole program is monitored and checked out in various laboratories before it's uh, approved. And they have inspectors who go around and check the machines. So um, the answer to that, Ron, is um, it, really there's no way that you, sadly, even though you might want to, can control the machine and try and make a profit from it. Back to you, Chris. <laughs> Just to add to that, Clive, I think from the uh, player's point of view, although it's pseudo-random, it may well be random since they yes. can't predict anything. That's what I was saying with the one second, you know, really, it's, it's a guess. You, you couldn't work out the logarithm, but technically it's pseudo-random. Okay, um, so we have a question coming through on the chat for Clive from um, one of our research officers, uh, Dylan Pickering. He wants to know, 
Um, what are the major betting strategies for professional sports and racing wagerers? And what are the personal characteristics and qualities of a profitable wagerer? So I figure you would be the best person to answer that question, Clive. Um, well, I'll start off with the personal characteristics because I've met only a few professional gamblers. Um, sometimes people claim to be professional gamblers, but when you get to know them and you follow it through for a little while, uh, some of the media people claim that they make money. Um, uh, when you know them, you find out over a period of time they don't. Of the small number of true professionals who I've met directly, they are almost obsessive compulsive. They're very controlled, very regulated. Um, the pinnacle in that uh, is it was the late Don Scott, who some may recall was a racing analyst and very successful punter for a number of years. Um, and, and he was very, very tight, very thorough. He kept scrupulous records. Uh, he worked 60 hours a week, which his wife uh, confirmed for, for me that, you know, he was always going through the form and analyzing and working out prices. Uh, even then it's worth noting that he had two periods of six months where everything was going wrong, but because he was totally controlled with his money and his finances, he was able to emerge from that and in the next six months still, still have a profitable year. Um, so are there successful strategies? Well, you mentioned sports betting, Dylan. I'll, I'll just briefly focus on racing. It's increasingly hard to have a, a chance of making money at racing because everybody's doing the same thing. There are so many computer analysts. Uh, sports bet, I was told by one of the authorities uh, with the company, has something like 120 analysts going through all of the things, including sports, making it extremely difficult. Perhaps, as I said earlier, on a sheer percentage basis, uh, sports betting gives you the best chance. But you still have to know the odds and um, be able to work out how players are going to do. And then strange things can happen even then because a, a lead player may limp off with a serious injury and the whole complexion of the game changes. Um, I've seen people who've claimed to make money fairly regularly from sports betting, but I've seen them also turn around and lose it when the very unexpected things happen because, because of the small takeout and the fact it's two games against the other, um, you, you can... Uh, get very short odds. And if you keep backing them at short odds, that's great. You'll get a long run of winners, but you'll probably lose. Ironically, um, this time last week, I was staying at the same place as the New Zealand Warriors, uh, having a little bit of a break. Um, and as I was checking out on Friday, I got chatting to the girl there and I said, well, you know, uh, they're playing the Panthers who are $1. ten, and the Warriors are $7. She said, oh, I don't bet on them. You're going to put anything on them. Not, not in your life, even though they seem to be nice guys, the few I had a chat to. Uh, but um, the margin then was about 17 and a half points. Um, and if you were tempted to do that, for example, you would have lost because they turned a pretty good effort to only lose by six. So it's a long answer to the question, but I, I think it's extremely difficult to make money regularly, reliably on gambling, on wagering. But if you are likely to do it, you have to be willing to lock yourself away, um, study things. You're in a poker, you've got to be able to play for hours, blackjack, card cutting, before you get thrown out. You've got to be able to put hours of solid work into it, and that requires a, a very strong temperament of focus. Alec, any, any comments? Sir? What is the influence of um, the criminal elements? We know, for example, fine cotton affair. We've had some recent uh, drug uh, issues with uh, horse racing. We know the World Cup soccer and uh, quite extensive uh, um, match fixing going on. Uh, how does the professional punter take that into account? Again, on the few people that I've spoken to, they... Uh, <laughs> Oh, well, we're having a recycle there. Uh, for example, Don Scott at one stage sent um, a whole lot of race results to the stewards saying these results require some thinking because these horses are not running at the level and my very experienced analysis suggests that they should. Um, and they were looked at and on that occasion um, uh, one charge was actually laid, if I remember correctly. Um, but um, mostly they say, look, um, we, we try to be aware of anything that might happen. Sudden moves from a particular horse from certain stables. Um, I guess um, sudden amounts of money put on by friends of people who are playing in a particular game uh, might alert them to either not bet or maybe bet on the same side, um, you know, go along with it. But the view that they've had is that by and large, it's pretty well controlled. It crops up, you hear it. Um, it gets picked up, it might have gone undetected for a while, uh, but ultimately it's found out. And so they just see that as one of the hazards that they have to deal with when working out their betting. 
All right. Um, we did have one, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left and we did have one question that came through on the email early in the week from Sondra um, at Hope Street, was, which was um, this question, I guess, that sometimes comes up, uh, particularly working with family members of gamblers. I know I've been asked it before in the past, and that is, um, are problem gamblers just greedy people? Alex, perhaps you might want to start on this one. I'm, I've heard some comments, but you go first, if you like. I think uh, greedy is a pejorative term. I, I think that there are a group of individuals that have the mistaken belief that uh, gambling is a way of uh, generating income um, and then they lock themselves into what Lesieux calls sort of chasing of the losses, which uh, we all know about. Um, and I think that there are a whole range of other motivations that lead people to uh, pursue uh, sort of continued gambling. Um, I don't like the word greedy because it, it does tend to be disrespectful, demeaning to individuals that may have a gambling disorder. Um, I would prefer to uh, uh, refer to these individuals as having the erroneous belief that they could in fact win in the long term, where statistically that will become uh, virtually impossible um, over the long term. And in, in my view, part of the difficulty, of course, is that uh, um, Although people expect to uh, lose, uh, there's always a uh, hope of winning. You could win, and that's what uh, drives some of these particular people in, in, particularly if they're in debt and they're trying to get money. I don't think it's greed. I think it's a desperation of uh, attempting to get themselves out of a financial difficulty that gambling has created by continuing to gamble to get out of that particular debt. Perhaps I could add that um, in my early days as I started out getting involved with horse racing, horse race betting, there are a number of um, phrases and sayings that get picked up and passed around and what have you. And one of them was on a really, really grotty day, the pouring rain and howling, freezing cold wind and horses sinking into the mud just about up to their hocks, the meeting almost called off. The only people attending the racing people would say are the needy and the greedy. And uh, it was kind of interesting, um, if you like, in both senses, the, the, both those words are somewhat pejorative, and I agree with Alex on that. But I, I think that um, a lot of people start out with a, maybe a, an element of greed um, in, the, in that they want to get money, and some have argued some, it's money for nothing, but they're also getting entertainment. Um, and it's a fun thing to be involved with. Yes, there's a chance of a prize, but very often that's an art motivating factor, but not necessarily the sole motivating factor. And then when, of course, as we commented, it gets uh, out of hand, uh, then you get to the needy side and the need is to get money back to pay the bills. And I've always said, in my view, the one single factor, somebody said to me, what causes problem gamblers for mine? The one single factor is chasing losses. And I'm always advising people, even colleagues, you know, entertaining. I had one read the guy, I don't think he's got a problem, but he, he does lose and he does a lot. And he said to me just recently, oh, you know, at the end of the day, I hadn't had a winner. I was due for a winner. I said, no, no, don't, don't go there. You know, don't even start thinking that. You know, in, in one of my runs of analysis, I had, I, bit, I had 35 losers in a row and I managed to knock over three odds on favourites who all lost. You just don't know. Uh, I've seen favourites lose, you know, on two occasions. Uh, you know, 28 races in a row. It favourites normally win one and three. So it's that sort of chasing. Um, and the same happens with poker machines. You know, I'm due. The darn machine hasn't paid. Um, so it's my turn. And you just really have to kill that thinking because the machine doesn't know, the horse doesn't know. <laughs> and, and you can get some very long runs that have been recorded in casinos as well as uh, at racetracks. And I guess I, I probably add to that, that question myself a little bit as well because I often get it from... Uh, even from gamblers themselves, like, is there something wrong with me? Am I, am I greedy? Is there something, I don't know. And I always say to them, let's, let's try and take this out of the moral terms here, because at the end of the day, a lot of the things that each of us do every single day is to get money. Like we, we go to work to get money. You know, our society is based on, on money. So it's not necessarily greedy to do something. If you believe that it's going to help you make money, the more problem is that is the belief that you can make money from this. That's more of the problem necessarily than, um, the desire to sort of have more money to, particularly for gamblers, get themselves out of that desperate situation that they're in. So, all right. Well, um, unfortunately, that's getting towards the end of our time today. Now, for anyone in the audience that has any additional questions, I'm sure uh, if you email them through to me and I can, or to Clive or Alex directly, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer uh, any additional questions that you have. Um, did 
Gentlemen, did you want to have some concluding remarks before we finish up today? Oh, thanks. Hello? Do you, want to make a, do you want to make a concluding remark or, or pass on a tip for Saturday? Or? Uh, the, the, the best way to double your money in the races is to fold it over and put it in your pants. <laughs> I, I think that's our, our concluding view that we just need to keep reminding probably ourselves as well as uh, our customers that um, gambling's not there for us. Uh, it, it's the, unless we're really serious professionals and we choose the form and we're willing to put the time and the effort in, it, it's there for the government and it's there for the industry. Um, it's there for the promoters. And yes, have a good time, but make sure that you're not spending more on it um, you know, than is a, a, the equivalent of the entertainment value that you hope you're getting out of it. So. Yeah, I think it's that, that balance between the sort of concept of uh, this is an activity which some people find mindless mm -hmm. uh, versus other people who find it uh, entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that balance for some people enjoy it, other people uh, shy away from it. Um, but the main issue effectively is that we, the, the reality is that a small percentage of individuals for a variety of reasons get themselves into trouble and they certainly require uh, assistance as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to um, extend my thanks back both to Alex and Clive for participating in the discussion today. I'd also like to thank Harrison, who is um, the IT professional at the Brain and Mind Center who has set this all up today. And he's done um, a lot of work to keep things running smoothly. So thanks, a big thanks to him. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our next journal club is going to be um, in late October, and um, you'll hear some exciting news on that very soon. Okay, thanks everyone. everybody. Thank you. All the best.